Well, welcome back, everybody, to our uh, class, uh, URCNA 101. We are uh, going through uh, the history, as I said last time, uh, the, this class will cover th this first section of history, and then we'll get into some various topics um, where the URC ha has made stands or what is the sort of the traditional uh, position within the URC if no stand has been made. And so in this section of history that uh, we started last time, you'll recall that I went back all the way to creation. And, uh, and the reason I did that is because Heidelberg Catechism 21, question 54 says, what do you believe concerning the Holy Catholic Church? And uh, I'm just going to repeat it now because I think it's important that we keep that in front of us. I believe that the Son of God, through His Spirit and Word, out of the entire human race, from the beginning of the world to its end, gathers, protects, and preserves for himself a community chosen for eternal life and united in true faith. And of this community I am and always will be a living member. And so because it's, it says it's from the beginning of the world to the end, um, that would indicate that uh, it's a confessional matter <laughs> and, and one which I you know, not, don't believe just because it's the confessions. I think Adam and Eve were members in the church, um, the first uh, members in the church, uh, the true church of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, and so then we looked at that. We looked at Israel, the patriarchs, and the monarchy. Then um, we, you know, we're jumping very quickly uh, to the coming of Christ and his, uh, uh, then the fact that he came for all people, not just Jews. And then, um, and then we started looking at, you know, sort of the early church uh, and the early, uh, uh, the, the dispersion of the early church. Uh, because of persecution, and then the coming of Constantine, uh, who uh, um, became a convert to Christianity, and uh, uh, Christianity was officially uh, recognized by the state, and persecution stopped, and became actually the dominant, the dominant uh, uh, religion in, uh, in Rome at that time. And uh, then following that really comes the, the Roman Catholic Church. And so we followed all of that history to the Great Schism. And we did talk about that a little bit, but in, in 1054 A.D., um, a division happened called the Great Schism. And uh, that then uh, brought about or resulted in the Eastern Orthodox churches and the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, so now what used to be just one monolithic church, the Roman Catholic Church, became divided. And there's, at that point, two. Um, and we looked at why that was. Uh, there were some social reasons. There were some church polity reasons. And then uh, doctrinal reasons. Particularly, we, we discussed the filioque clause of the Nicene Creed. Uh, and the sun. You might recall that, so I'm not going to get into that again. Uh, but the Eastern Church, we're not going to go over the Eastern Church, but what is very interesting is uh, just uh, looking at recent news, particularly with uh, 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 Russia and Ukraine, um, and uh, I don't know if any of you listened to the briefing, but Al Mohler was bringing this up this past week in the briefing about how the, uh, uh, what do they call it, the the bishop or whatever of the, of the um, uh, Russian Orthodox Church is very good friends with Putin, and uh, and and then there's also the Ukrainian the uh, Orthodox Church, and uh, there's just some politics that are happening even now uh, within the uh, the Orthodox churches. Um, now, my purpose in this class is not to follow that line. Um, in fact, the, we're following from the Roman Catholic Church to and through the Reformation and through, through the Dutch Reformed Churches that finally will bring us to the United Reformed Churches. I mean, that's the line we're following, and I'm going to try to stick fairly closely to that line, um, but it is interesting to, to see these differences uh, and, and issues uh, really even having effect today 
in world history. Um, so uh, I think the last thing that I said is, is with that great schism in 1054, um, there was, uh, you know, the issue was polity and uh, confessional matters. And uh, that becomes really a repeated issue, e- repeated issues when it comes to church splits. Polity and confessional issues, uh, including why the URC exists. Okay, see this? I got this new board. What happened then? (laughs) Everybody should know that date. 1517. Wittenberg, right? That's when uh, Luther, uh, supposedly, there's some people who have questioned the... the, uh, the specifics of that, but supposedly nailed his 95 theses on the, uh, the door of the Wittenberg church, uh, which of course was Roman Catholic, and, uh, uh, and that act triggered the Protestant Reformation, okay? Um, and, uh, and as a result, the Roman Catholic church the, the Western Church, not Eastern Orthodox, but the Roman Catholic Church, the Western Church, ends up dividing again, all right, as a result. So what caused the Reformation? Well, there was definitely confessional issues uh, that were of concern. Um, again, the Roman Catholic Church never did say, nor does it say today, that they no longer believe the Bible. All right, they, they would say that they believe the Bible, that they, they venerate the Bible, they hold it up. Um, but the problem is that our under, or the, the Protestants' understanding of what the Bible teaches is different than what the Roman Catholic Church understands the Bible to teach. And so that's why we say it becomes a confessional matter, a confessional matter. Um, so both believe, for instance, that we're saved by faith, but the Protestants' issue is that we are saved through faith alone. And, uh, of course, the Roman Catholic Church um, believes that works are also included in the faith. So, really, the confessional differences became issues of justification, how we are right with God, uh, how it is that we are saved, the, some very basic, basic questions that brought about the, uh, the Protestant Reformation, but there were also polity differences. And again, I'm going through this very quickly. I, I, my purpose is not to delve into all of the issues uh, because there are a lot more issues than what I'm bringing up. Uh, but there were polity issues too, uh, particularly uh, the Protestants uh, differed from sort of the hierarchical approach of the Roman Catholicism and questioned the authority of the Pope. Of the Pope. Uh, the papal authority, and uh, complained about the papacy and and all of that. So all of that was included uh, as part of what brought about or caused the Protestant Reformation. And so um, what resulted from that? Well, on the Roman Catholic side, the the Roman Catholics, um, they actually... uh, uh, declared at the Council of Trent in 1547, so 30 years later after there's been a lot of uh, disruption in the church because of the Reformation, uh, they declared the Protestant position or teaching on justification to be anathema, which is accursed and basically, uh, you know, unbiblical. Uh, among many other things, when you look at the uh, conclusions of the Council of Trent, there are a number of things that they call anathema, but this one is, ba- is big, you know, that, that basically they're saying, if you believe what the Protestants are teaching regarding justification, you're outside of the church. That's basically what they were saying. You're anathema. And so that was a very serious thing. Uh, Council of Trent, you can look that up, and by the way, this isn't just me giving my uh, input here. This is, you can look it up. You can find the conclusions of the Council of Trent on uh, on the internet, and it's, uh, it's, it's just very clear, anathema, anathema, there's a lot of things. Um, 
On the Protestant side, um, it would be wonderful to say <laughs> that uh, there's now there's, you know, okay, you have the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox is over there, and now there's Roman Catholic Church splits, and so you have the Roman Catholic Church and you have the Protestant Church. Never happened. <laughs> uh, uh, never happened. Uh, the Protestants uh, never formed one body, uh, sadly. Um, and so uh, you have different groups now that, that sort of came out of uh, Protestantism. And uh, so you have the uh, Anabaptists. Anabaptists. is one group. Uh, who today would be most like the Anabaptists? Mennonites, yep. So uh, Amish, Mennonites, I mean, they, they, those would be most like uh, the Anabaptists. Interestingly, just a, a, as, as a historical interest, um, what what we would look at as most Baptist churches or most Baptist denominations actually come out not from the Anabaptist line uh, stream, but actually from the Reform stream and have uh, broken off uh, uh, since then. But you have the Anabaptists, then you have also the Lutherans. Um, we can put here Presbyterian and then Reformed although those are so close. I guess the difference here I'm making, sorry, as it gets lower, I can't write it as well. Um, really theologically, actually, soteriologically, um, these three are very, very close, uh, you, you know, in, in holding to uh, uh, God's sovereign grace and such. Uh, but the Presbyterian and Reformed are very, very close. And the reason that I make a distinction here mainly is um, geographic. Uh, in other words, the Presbyterian Reformed uh, were on, in Britain, on the British islands, and the, the Reformed that I'm saying here would be called the Continental Reformed. They were on, on the continent of Europe, okay? Okay. Uh, Theologically, though, they are very similar. And uh, I do want to make that point. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I could add Anglicans <laughs> to that. Um, that's the Anglican Church, uh, the Church of England. Uh, uh, so, yeah, yeah, that could... I could put that in there as, as well. Um, my, but what I, wanna, what I just simply want to bring out here is that, you know, Lutherans were primarily in Germany. Presbyterianism is in Britain. And Reformed is on, on the continent. And primarily... Um, the Netherlands, the Lowlands, uh, and Belgium. So uh, that's where sort of the Reformed uh, really took off in the Netherlands and or the Lowlands. Uh, at that time, uh, the the Lowlands included what is today the Netherlands and Belgium. Um, so that was just one area under one rule, and uh, that's why we call the, the Belgic Confession the Belgic Confession, uh, because Guido de Bray was in the area of Belgium, even though he was part of the lowlands, so just that, that's why that is. Um, so what I want to do now is just simply go to uh, uh, this, this section here, and particularly the Netherlands, Okay. Um, that's where uh, I want to take us because that is where our roots are in the United Reformed Churches. Um, 
So as I said, the, the Reformation and Reformation theology um, really took hold in the lowlands, in, in the Netherlands and Belgium, that area. Uh, now, it did in other areas as well, uh, but, uh, uh, but there it, it seemed to really, you know, grab on. And, uh, and there were several what we would call today independent Reformed churches in the Netherlands. In other words, there was not a denomination that they were all part of. Uh, they were Reformed theologically, uh, church politically probably, but, uh, uh, but they were not united together. Um, and that's uh, already in 1550 that that is happening. Uh, so way back in 1550... In 1561, anybody know that date? Belgic Confession. All right, 1561, uh, the Belgic Confession. Guido de Bray uh, writes the Belgic Confession. In how about 1563? Heidelberg Catechism. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, 1561, Belgic. 1563, the Heidelberg Catechism is written. And in 1566, there is the first sort of church gathering, uh, we we might call it a synod, of the Reformed churches in the Netherlands. And they all agreed to adopt the Belgic Confession as uh, the sort of the confessional basis of their churches. So that happened already in 1566. there was another uh, uh, sort of gathering or synod, or uh, they called it the Convent of, of Basel in 1568. Uh, there they dealt with a lot of polity issues, remember church government issues, that they were dealing with that, 1568. Uh, in 1571 uh, was this, the synod Emden, Emden. Uh, it's, a, it's a city in the Netherlands, Emden, and uh, there the churches actually agreed to federate together and become sort of a a unit, a body. They committed to one another. Uh, Jumping a few years, we come to 1618. It's another important year. Anybody? Senator Dort. Senator Dort happened 1618, 1619. This was actually a national, international synod, even though a lot of the issues were happening in the Netherlands and the city of Dordrecht is in the Netherlands. Um, there were uh, representatives uh, from Presbyterianism, from the British Islands, and other countries in Europe who came and attended uh, the Synod of Dort. And so it is an international synod, and the decisions of Dort were international, uh, internationally agreed or approved on. Um, uh, I, I think I can get through some of these things anyway. Uh, uh, so the Synod of Dort did a number of things. We, we're very familiar with the canons of Dort, right? Uh, the, the five points we call, it, they are so-called the five points of Calvinism. Uh, Calvinism has more than five points, but anyway, uh, uh, those five points that are, are brought out in the Synod of Dort are actually answers to the five issues that was brought to synod by the remonstrance. And, uh, and so they answered those five. We know them as TULIP, uh, or it's better to say ULTIP. U-L-T-I-P is how it's actually, uh, actually laid out and printed. So unconditional election, limited atonement, total depravity, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. They were bringing these things out because the remonstrance were saying the opposite. Okay, and so they had to clarify that. So the, the, the canons of Dort was one of the things that came out of the Synod of Dort. <clears throat> they also adopted the Heidelberg Catechism so that they had the Belgian Confession, they adopted the Heidelberg Catechism, and also wrote the, the canons of Dort. And so now all of a sudden you have the first uh, expression of the three forms of unity. Right, which is what our confessional uh, stand is on the three forms of unity. Uh, they also commissioned a, a, a Dutch Bible translation. Um, now, again, remember in Roman Catholicism, uh, the Bible in, your, in the common language was not allowed. Uh, and that became that was a big problem. It was only can only be in Latin, um, and uh, you know that was one of the things that Luther really was pushing is getting the Bible into German. 
And, uh, and so now you have in, the, uh, in 16, 18, and 19 at the Synod of Dort, they commissioned a Dutch Bible translation uh, called the Statenvertalen, uh, the, 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 state, the, the state language or the state translation. Um, they also put together a church order, a church order of Dort, uh, which the URC church order is based on. And, then, um, and they established the NGK the Nederland Gereformeerde Kerk, uh, or the Dutch Reformed Church. And uh, let me say, for about 200 years, um, things went, were going pretty smoothly. You know, so that was it. And if that was, you know, from 1618 to uh, 1816 uh, will be the next date I want to bring up, although our time is running out. But um, so, so, uh, what, what I've done today, from the Protestant Reformation, you have uh, the, the Dutch church being established, really. Uh, first, independent congregations, but then as things go on, they establish into the Nederland Gereformeerde Kerk, NGK, and, uh, and for until about 1816, uh, things uh, were going quite well. Uh, in 1816, by the way, that's when uh, King William the I comes into power and uh, makes the Reformed Church the, basically the state church, and uh, things started going downhill. <laughs> things started going downhill after that happened. So, uh, but our time is uh, about up, and so we'll stop there. Any questions or comments? Except about Anglicanism. I really don't know much about Anglicanism. <laughs> No? Okay. Um, well, let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, that you are the God of history and that uh, all things that happen in history is, uh, is by your uh, plan, and, uh, and we thank you that you do all things well. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that uh, uh, you have been pleased uh, to uh, raise up believers throughout the centuries and uh, that uh, we who profess Christ that here this morning uh, can trace back uh, the roots. Uh, and, uh, and Lord, we give you thanks. And now, uh, Father, as we gather for our, uh, our next worship, we pray that you would be glorified in it. For Jesus' sake, amen.